welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. I'm Ron. And I'm Jean Marie. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we're talking with Dr. Casey Kelly. Dr. Kelly graduated from the Ohio State University College of Medicine and completed her residency in family medicine at St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago. She's a 10-year member of the Institute of Functional Medicine, IFM. She's also a director on the board of the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society, ILADS. And she is a founding member of the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, also known as AIHM. Dr. Kelly is on the faculty at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Good morning, Dr. Kelly. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for joining our show and taking time out of your busy day. Could you tell us a little bit more about ILADS? Sure. ILADS. ILADS is making a big difference in the tick-borne disease community. I actually sit on the board of directors. I, I just got upgraded to treasurer this year, and I'm continuously blown away by what we can do to help advance um, teaching and education about ILADS. It's ILADS is a nonprofit international medical society, actually dedicated to teaching providers how to treat Lyme and other tick-borne infections. Um, and that includes research, education, and policy changes. And we support physicians, scientists, researchers, and other healthcare professionals. And um, we're dedicated to advancing the standard of care for Lyme and associated diseases using research and, and scientific grounded evidence to to help treat patients better. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, that sounds like a wonderful organization. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Kelly, I have a three-part question. What are some of the most common tick-borne diseases? How common are tick-borne diseases? And finally, is the incidence of tick-borne diseases on the rise? Okay, good. Let me let me unpack this a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> the most common tick-borne diseases um, probably the most common that we all talk about is Lyme disease. And sure. Lyme is caused by a bacteria that's called Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, there are actually multiple Borrelia species that can cause diseases in humans. There are tick-borne relapsing fevers, and there are new Borrelia species being found all the time. That kind of gets used as an umbrella term, Lyme disease, mm -hmm. to talk about these infections that come on ticks because ticks carry multiple infections, not just the Borrelia burgdorferi or other Borrelia species, but multiple other infections as well, including other bacteria, parasites, and viruses. So Lyme often gets you know, used a lot, but there are other infections as well. Um, and some of the other most common ones, at least in the Midwest where I am in Chicago, uh, are Lyme, Bartonella, which is a bacteria, Babesia, which is a parasite, and Anaplasma and Ehrlichia, those are bacterial infections as well. And they all have overlapping symptoms, symptomatology, so it can be kind of tricky to, to weed out what's there. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, part of the detective work that we have to do when we're dealing with these um, diseases. Um, they are extremely common. You know, if you, talk, if you look at the CDC, unfortunately, they are saying something like 30,000 people a year are contracting Lyme disease, but the actual numbers are better estimated probably closer to 400,000 a year. Wow. 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 Big difference. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Big difference. Big, big difference. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not as understood as it should be in when, and doctors aren't trained as they should be. So they get missed a lot. And when these chronic or these acute infections, excuse me, become chronic, they become a totally different thing and can cause a whole host of issues. Um, and they are absolutely on the rise. And, and part of that is because of global warming and, and those kind of things, because ticks really only hibernate when it's frost and frozen. Okay. So they're active when it's warm outside. Sure. And so even if there's snow on the ground, but if it's not frozen, they'll still, wow. they'll still be active. I had a patient last year in December who had a tick bite. So, you know, they're out there more um, for, you know, for multiple reasons, but that's a part of it. So these are, these are definitely on the rise and, um, and, and a big problem that's 
or not being as recognized as it should be. So, Dr. Kelly, although I'm a little bit familiar with bacterial infections spread by ticks, I was surprised to read that ticks can also spread some viruses and parasites. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Yeah. So there are other infections. Like I kind of think of it as an entourage. So Lyme kind of brings its entourage with it on these <laughs> okay. ticks. So they carry other things as well. Um, Babesia, as I mentioned, is a, it's actually a parasite. It's, it's similar to malaria and can cause Ooh. a whole host of issues, blood clotting issues, um, breathing issues hot sweats, night flashes, or hot flashes, night sweats, there we go. Um, and there's some other viruses, there's viruses that will come on these ticks as well, like Powassan virus, which is kind of a, a, a bigger buzzword as of late, that's kind of growing um, and being spread as well. So there's other, a lot of different kinds of infections that get spread by ticks. Wow, that's surprising. Um before I continue on our, our regular interview, I just wanted to throw in a, a statement that I think you should write a paper, uh, an information paper, to the, I guess, to the governor who is, or to the adjutant general. Uh, Jean and I were both members of the Illinois Army National Guard for a number of years, and we trained regularly in Wisconsin. And Jean was a medic, and she has taken quite a few ticks off. Several hundred ticks. <laughs> I, I think more oh, wow. the VA wow. should be hypercognitive of the fact that but not just the VA. I'm thinking foreign diseases are something you know they should be aware of because yeah, I can't even tell you how many people I've removed ticks from. I've right. removed and, ticks from every part of, the, part of the body. Right, and who follows up on that? That's right? a good question. So anyway, I think uh, maybe an information yeah. paper, a white paper to let them know how big of a problem this is and that what they should be aware of. All right, now I'm back on track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, in Illinois, actually, in, in our Illinois government, they are making some good strides and, and passing some laws and bills to get more education and, and more knowledge and more treatment options available for patients in Illinois. We're leading the charge in that in a lot of ways. Um, I'm actually, um, I get to talk with a scientist, um, Holly Tooten, next week, who's researching ticks in as part of Illinois state oh. and um, f- going out and finding ticks and seeing what's in there and, and mm-hmm. putting it on a map so we can actually show providers that no baby is exists in your county excellent you yeah. excellent I like right. that yeah. right it's fantastic yeah. uh well I know you know if I find a tick I'll I'll ask Jean to remove <laughs> it <laughs> but as a as a <laughs> as a as a normal human if uh, if someone finds a tick, should they remove it themselves, or should they ask a healthcare prof- professional to remove it for them? And also, should they save the tick? Yes, I mean, if you have trouble removing it, then you can always ask a healthcare provider. But you should be able to remove it yourself. There's lots of YouTube videos out there. Um, the trick is to get some tweezers and get you know as close to the skin as possible at the head of the tick and pull straight up until it releases. Don't use Vaseline, don't use flames, just pull straight up and it will release. There's also some um, devices called tick twisters where you kind of slide it around the head and twist and pull up. And that's also really easy um, to remove it that way. Um, But as soon as you find it, the faster you can remove it, the better. Okay. And absolutely save the tick. Save the tick, you can send the tick in for testing. There are several places where you can send the tick in um, and they'll test for multiple infections. Um, tickreport.com is one. There's another one called technology.com. <laughs> and they, it's much easier. To, yeah. It's much easier to find these infections in the tick mm-hmm. than it is to find it in a human. Okay. So if you get a tick, especially if it's engorged, send it in because that way you know, your physician can know what we're dealing with. If there's any infections in that tick, then we can better treat you. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So as a follow-up to that, doctor, what are some indications that someone has contracted a tick-borne disease? You mentioned about what is it, uh, being engorged? Well, that's... That the tick, not right. you. No, I know. The, oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. But, but again, the tick is... <laughs> I think that's a different episode. Oh, okay. But no, if the tick is engorged, but I mean, what are some of the things um, that you? So, in other words, like you want somebody, to know, like, yeah, you want to know whether or not you caught something right. after you got bit right. by the tick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I wish it were 
super simple and black and white to answer that. Um, certainly the longer the tick has been on you, the bigger the risk that it has transmitted something to you. And there's various different research out there as far as how long it takes that tick to transmit an infection to you, be it as short as 10 minutes, up to 24 hours. There's kind of a, a broad range out there. So that's why I said the sooner the better, get it off. Um, the kind of quintessential pathognomonic Lyme disease um, sign is a bullseye rash. So if you develop a bullseye rash, and it's not painful, it's not itchy, um, it's shaped like a bullseye, okay. and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, if you see that, that is Lyme disease. Nothing else does that. You need to get treated for 30 days with an antibiotic to help prevent this from becoming chronic. Um, the other sign, though, a lot of people never see a rash mm -hmm. or never get a rash. Right. A lot of people actually never see a tick, for that matter, which makes it all that more complicated. But the acute Symptoms, generally speaking, for, for Lyme as well as uh, most of the co-infections are more of a flu-like illness. So sometimes a fever, fatigue, joint pain and swelling can also be a big part of that, especially if it moves around. So it's your knee and it's your elbow and oh, wow. ankle. Okay. Um, those are good signs that you've got a tick infection. So okay. the problem is most people, like I said, don't see the tick. They don't see the rash. They get, you know, a flu-like illness that can be pretty mild. It goes away, and they seem like they're fine. They just think that they, you know, caught a virus or something, got mm -hmm. the flu or whatnot. But it's not super typical to get those flu-like illness symptoms in the middle of the summer. So okay. that can be a sign. You know, 2020 has been a, a little weird right. for that. Right. But, right. Right. <laughs> you know, typically that doesn't happen. Um, you know, the, the other issue, though, is these chronic issues. So if you don't catch it right away, it can develop into these a whole host of different symptoms in different people. It's, it's really the great, Lyme is really the great mimicker. So people can pre present with multiple sclerosis-like symptoms, with wow. rheumatoid arthritis, with chronic fatigue. And so it can be really, really tricky to figure out if that's what happened. But you know, if you've been sick for two, three, five, 20 years and no one can figure it out and all of your labs are normal, that's when it's absolutely worth looking at these infections as an underlying cause. Okay. Right. That's great advice. Is, is there actually a blood test that they could run then at that point and say, you know, we've done everything else, but then we could run this particular blood test to see it was a tick? You can try, although the testing for Lyme is very gray. Unfortunately, that's part, another big hiccup in this foreign world is that the testing for it is rather difficult and that's where the research we haven't is really in, developed huh? mm -hmm. yeah this you know perfect black and white test so Lyme disease you could do a western blot test um, a lot of people will get the screening antibody test or screening test which is a horrible test it misses over half the people but that will come back negative so their doctor won't do any more testing so the western blot at the very least is the test that needs to be run to try to figure out if Lyme is an underlying culprit. Okay. okay, thank you. And what treatments are available to treat these tick-borne diseases? There, uh, you can always start with antibiotics. There are a host of herbal antibiotics. And when it comes into this chronic world, it becomes a lot more complex. And so a full treatment plan really, you, I, you know, I'm a little biased because I myself have been, I am an integrative medicine doctor. I have my certif board certification in family medicine as well as integrative medicine. And integrative medicine looks at the system as a whole and tries to get down to the why, why people are sick. And so when dealing with these chronic infections, it's not like you can just take a medicine for two weeks and be done with it. It takes a lot more than that. You're often on mm -hmm. antibiotics for months, for weeks, for years. Um, and there's a lot of repair that has to be done as well, gut healing, neurological support. It's, it's pretty complex and complicated. It can be done and it can take a while, but people, we can really ge regain health if we look at the system as a whole. You know, the, the little asterisk next to that is if you are quote unquote lucky enough to see a dick and get a bullseye rash and get medicine immediately, then you then that might be able to be done. You take your meds for a month and you can kind of, hopefully be done with it. But it's the chronic infections that take a lot more time to really treat and heal. 
mm-hmm. but there are treatments. There's a lot of different things out there. A lot of docs get pretty creative with the different ways that we can help with um, herbs and IVs and, and supplements um, to help people heal and repair from this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I guess then um, the goal should really be not getting bit by a tick. So my question yeah. is, um, <laughs> how can we avoid contracting tick-borne illnesses and how can yeah. we avoid tick bites? Then, yeah, that is a great question and a great point because prevention is key. Sure. Um, I don't ever want people to feel a- afraid or scared to go outside and, and a lot of Lyme patients, you know, have that fear. When, you know, they see the woods, they get scared because that's mm-hmm. what made them sick, right? Mm-hmm. But I think if we're prepared, um, we can still go out inside and enjoy enjoy being in nature. Okay. You can start by spraying your clothes. So you can buy permethrin mm-hmm. at any um, sporting goods store and spray your clothes, your socks, your shoes, your pants, um, your hat, and spray them down outside in a well-ventilated area. Let them dry. And those will usually, that permethrin is a, a bug repellent. And that will last about six washes or so on your clothes. Oh. Oh. Then you also need to use some safe, non-toxic tick sprays on your skin. So permethrin is not skin safe if mm-hmm. you just spray it on your skin. But there are some tick repellents. Um, Ranger Ready is a good brand. You can also find um, some with lemon eucalyptus oil. Those are non-toxic for your skin. So spray your skin with the bug spray. That's safe. And then you have to be just super, super hip and tuck your pants into your socks. <laughs> look really awesome um, if you have long hair wear a hat um, and then you know after you're out and you enjoy your time then you need to do a tick check afterwards and mm-hmm. you know look in all the crevices behind your ears and your scalp and um, they can be extremely tiny which is why if you wear the repellents you're going to help reduce that but then right. do a tick check afterwards um, and generally speaking if you find anything you'll find it fast enough so that's not a problem uh, in that case, and then you can help prevent being bitten by a tick in the first place. Okay. And That's... I know when we take our dogs for a walk in the forest, when we come back, we always do a tick check because um, they're so low to the ground and we have found um, ticks yeah. on more than one occasion. And we don't want them to yeah, snuggle up in bed point. with us. <laughs> and then the tick falls off and yeah. it looks, oh, for mm-hmm. something else to eat. Yeah. 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 And if you sh- if you let your dogs into your bed and then get out of it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Great point. Check your dogs, get your dogs to the vet to so get sick prevention as well. How long do ticks live? Oh, that's a great question. They're pretty indispensable. <laughs> or, um, they, they, um, yeah, I've heard that they can um, live in water and all these other things, but they, they last for quite a while. They're kind of like cockroaches. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Good to know. No, it's not good to know. <laughs> no, it is good to know. <laughs> Cockroaches uh, of the forest. Yeah, Wonderful. wow. So, Dr. Kelly, uh, this is all interesting stuff. What actually drove your interest in getting into medicine in the first place? Yeah, you know, I've always been one of those kids who liked going to the doctor, which is, you know, odd for a small child. But I was always into science. I was always into helping people. Mm-hmm. And so I got interested in being a doctor when I was really young. It was, it was a, a lifelong kind of goal um, okay. for me. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, it's actually good. There's a lot of people that don't know what they want to do right. early on. You did. That's great. I still don't know what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. And how about you? <laughs> you're a podcaster. And how about uh, your interest in integrative health in particular? Yeah, so integrative health, I, I started to kind of dive into a little bit once I was in med school. Um, I I had some trouble kind of understanding why we weren't asking why people were sick. So we were very good at diagnosing people, putting a name on things, and then giving them medicine for that. And then we would have to give them medicine for the side effects for the medicine we gave them for, you know, the first thing we mm-hmm. diagnosed. But no one was asking why they were sick, especially with these chronic, complex illnesses. And, you know, going into primary care, you're, you know, you're, you're dealing with these you know, families and lifelong care of their health and not, you know, just a broken foot, which, you know, Western medicine is great for, you know, that kind of thing. But I just really struggled with the why. And, you know, I kept digging a little bit farther and I started to learn more about nutrition and supplements and in residency I, I dug even farther 
into that world and, and realized there was these groups of doctors out there who had been doing this for a while who were looking at the why, who were really trying mm-hmm. to figure out why people were sick. Um, and I also, I mean, I had some of my own medical issues as well that started when I was in my teens and 20s that weren't getting answered by the general conventional mindset, Mm -hmm. um, tried different medicines and different therapies and nothing was really working. And so, you know, my own health was also driving this search for why, Sure. why am I sick? Why does this feel horrible? Um, and you know, you just, at that point it was a lot of self taught. So I had to go to conferences. I had to go learn on my own this different aspect, um, and approach to medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, I myself was diagnosed with Lyme disease um, probably eight to 10 years ago at this point. Uh, and through that journey, that's really how I got into to treating Lyme patients um, was through my own self journey and healing, helping heal myself from that and learning how to help other people. Well, that's great. You've actually been there and done that and walked in, you know, walked those shoes. Yeah, walked in those shoes. And yeah, I think that can make you a more empathetic care provider as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Dr. Kelly, what advice do you have for those that are interested in pursuing a career in medicine? And also, what advice do you have for recent medical school graduates? Especially during COVID. Yeah, especially <laughs> during these interesting times. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine being in school mm-hmm. during COVID. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of mind boggling. But, um, you know, I, there's so many different types of medical providers nowadays. Um, you know, physicians are, are one, but there's you know, acupuncturists, there's nurse practitioners, you know, there's, there's so many different aspects to it. Medical school is not easy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard. It's mm-hmm. really, really hard. And you really have to, to know, I think that that's really, really what you want to do. Mm-hmm. If you're interested in helping people, my first advice would say, you know, great, awesome. Look at all the different roles that are available out there and see if there's one that may fit you better your personality, your, your lifestyle better than being a doctor. Right. You might find that going to PA school might be a lot better. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, look for that. Um, and then as far as advice for recent medical school graduates um, or even, you know, current medical students and things, I think learning how to gain some resiliency and some self-care and making sure you learn how to not burn out mm-hmm. is important and it often gets overlooked um, with doctors. You know, doctors make the worst patients. Mm-hmm. We don't really necessarily <laughs> take care of ourselves very well. And so learning those skills is extremely, extremely important. And it will help you be a better doctor if you help protect yourself and fill your cup up. Mm-hmm. But don't forget to take care of yourself. That's my advice. Good advice. <laughs> yeah, wonderful mm-hmm. advice. Uh, Dr. Kelly, what has helped you get through the challenges that this year has posed? Well, you know, a lot of that goes back to the resiliency and the self-care. Um, and so, you know, I have to make it a daily work to make sure that I'm taking care of myself as well. Um, cause it's, it's been a very stressful year. I, I started my practice case integrative health, um, in March of 2019 or May of 2019, excuse me. And so, you know, we just got into our new space and everything was up and running right when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was like, wow. Um, And, you know, I have a three-year-old, I have a husband, I have a dog, you know, I've got all these other things going on too. So I have to make it a point to practice self-care. I have to, Mm -hmm. you know, practice what I preach. I have to eat well. I have to exercise and and meditate. I wake up early every day. So I have time for myself, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. try to get myself prepared and prepped for my day right. so that I can be the best, you know, best version of me that I can be. Um, and kind of working through that and, and just trying to be flexible and adapt to this crazy world we live in and try to take it all, um, as an adventure mm-hmm. and with a little bit of humor as possible and just kind of try to get through. This is, this has been a tough one for yeah. sure. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, what final tips, hints, or helpful advice do you have for our listeners? I think it kind of goes back to um, the, what I was just talking about, you know, mm-hmm. making sure there's time for yourself. I think 
what I'm seeing in, in my patient, in my patient base who, you know, our patients who have these chronic complex illnesses, you know, I keep reminding everybody to, to give yourself grace because there's extra stress this year mm-hmm. and, you know, focus on the small wins, even if they seem small, you know, celebrate the victories, you know, celebrate the good stuff um, so that we can, you know, survive a little bit better. Um, hug your loved ones because touching is really important. So if, if you have people in your bubble, make sure you're, you're giving them hugs and, mm-hmm. and lots of love. Um, and when it comes to, you know, not just Lyme disease, but chronic complex illnesses in general, like if you are struggling with something, you know, deep down that something is wrong. You're not making this up. It's not that you need to go to a psychologist. Um, not that there's anything wrong with going to a psychologist or psychiatrist. That's absolutely a full part of all, all of our healing, mm-hmm. but you know, it's more than that. Like if you know, deep down that something's going on and every doctor you've been to is keeps brushing you off or, or saying there's, there's nothing wrong with you because your labs are normal. Keep digging, look into integrative medicine, functional medicine, try to find a practitioner near you that will listen, that will take the time to sit and listen to you and help you figure out the best way to healing. Excellent. Yeah, we're yes, all we're is. all sitting here nodding <laughs> our, our heads. heads. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> trying to trying to figure out how far is her practice. <laughs> Actually not far from us at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks to COVID, we do a lot of telemedicine mm-hmm, nowadays. Sure. Um, so a lot of virtual visits. Um, and you know, we've been able to kind of open up in a lot of ways because of that. Um, I guess that's a little bit of a silver lining to all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're able to reach patients all over the country, actually, which has been really, really fun. Good. Excellent. Yeah, that's fantastic. And how can our listeners and new patients that want to join your <laughs> practice uh, find out more about you and your practice? Sure. Yeah. I mean, check us out on the internet, caseintegrativehealth.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, our phone number for office is 773-675-1400. can always give us a call. Um, and you can email us to support at caseintegrativehealth.com. Thank you Fantastic. very much. We're going to put a link for that on our website. Yes. And then also in our phone book. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So um, on behalf of Jean Marie and Lita, uh, Dr. Kelly, we want to thank you so much for coming on this morning and enlightening us with all the information. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. If you have any questions or comments related to today's show, you can drop us a line at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified medical health care provider with any questions you have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new health care regime and never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something that you have heard on this podcast. Till next week. Bye-bye.